now we're going to get on to the changes to the wiring regs, BS 7671. What I'm hoping that you get out of this today is an understanding as to the changes. Okay, they, we could go on for days and, you know, Lantai and Lantai Learning do run 17th edition courses, which do go on for a couple of days to go into more, in, to go more in depth into the different areas with regards to the changes to the wiring regs and, you know, as many city and guilds and EAL courses do, get right into the nitty gritty as to the reasons why and how to be able to understand them a little bit better. So I'm hoping you get a, a good understanding of the changes of both what's included in BS 7671 and the changes to the forms, the certification, reporting, etc, etc. It's important to note at this point in time that there are no requirements to go and sit at City and Guilds or an EAL update course for this. Okay? It might be different when they bring out the 18th edition, which may be in three years' time, it may not be. Um, they do have a way about, if anybody has a good understanding of these particular kind of books, you'll know that they have like a colour coding. They'll go from the red book, they'll go to a green book, a yellow book, there'll be a blue book, there'll be a brown book. We're on a yellow one now, so who's necessarily saying that we might have another two that comes out, or we might just get straight on to having an 18th after this in about three or four years' time, you never know. But there isn't any requirement at present to do an update course. This will be sufficient. Getting a CPD certificate will show due diligence enough that you understand the changes. But then, you know, move forward and look at it in more depth for the areas that really do actually relate to the areas that you control. So that's what I hope you get out of today. Now, I do invite all of you to just stick your hands up and to jump in and to butt in whether you agree or you disagree. You've got something you want to bring to our attention. If there's a question you need to ask, if I can answer it, I will do. But you will see through the course of this that there are many unanswerable questions with regards to this particular book um, that will be answered hopefully within the next six months um, but we're going to touch on them today so started back in 1882 this is a this is a, a copy or this is a, an example of the first edition of the wiring regs it was a one-page document it was produced back in 1882 it had 21 regs and six of them related to a dynamo not really relevant any day, uh, anymore, to be fair. You're smiling like you know it very well. You know, if you do, you were the years well. Okay, wish I have your elixir of relief, and it's certainly not in the bottle of an absinthe bottle. So, but right back in 1882, we understood the importance of inspection and testing. We knew back then the importance that was placed upon ensuring that facilities or electrical systems were safe to be placed into use and for continued use. So in that respect, not much has changed. But in every other respect that can possibly be drawn in comparison to the wine regulations, everything has changed because our industry has changed, because our country has changed, because our installations have changed and what we do with them changes on a day-to-day -day basis. It wasn't that long ago. We didn't have charging points for electrical vehicles. Now they're coming up all over the place, which have their own particular unique requirements. We've gone from DC electric to AC electric. We now put panels on top of your houses to be able to generate DC electric to go through inverters to create AC electric, which then come through the sockets inside our houses to little power packs to convert it back into DC electric to power the electronic equipment that we stick a yearly pack test sticker on. So the things do change, and there are reasons why these things change, and they are kind of reflected. There's a lot of things that we don't do anymore, and we know, and we learn, and we develop as we go along. So back in 1882, we created, well, we didn't create, but the emergence of the wiring regulations to sort of give the basic understanding or the minimum acceptable level of electrical safety in the United Kingdom was created. Now, for Sparkies, there's a few of you in here, uh, myself included, you can sometimes feel like you're being hit with a shitty stick. That every time you go and buy, spend 80 quid on buying one of these books, they bring out another book and it's another 80 quid. And then they bring out another book and it's another 80 quid in an update course. But if we look at it and put it into perspective, that in the 130 odd years since these regulations have been created, we've only actually ever had 17 editions. So there's only been 17 editions of the wire regs in 130 odd years. All right, they probably loaded it up recently to be fair to make it seem like it's worse than it is but in those editions you probably had about three or four five amendments with inside them regulations so there's a few more books but it is important that these things change so back in 2008 we got from the 16th to the 17th edition 
Quite interestingly, that when we were at the 17th edition come into play, it very much felt like that one of the people that were involved in writing and producing the 17th edition had a friend that worked in a factory that made RCBOs because now we've got RCBOs everywhere. You need them on everything. Okay, and then we'll worry about the consequences of that to the domestic market at a later date and we'll compromise by giving them split low, split low boards. Sparky's in here, we'll know what I'm talking about. The rest of you will think I'm weird. But these RCBOs, which are mechanical devices, which are prone to failure, by the way, because they do, that's why we've got a test button on them. And they are a mechanical device that can freeze up if we don't test them regularly. Or they can become ultra sensitive and create nuisance tripping was then considered to be, in some respects, a much better way of affording protection than adequately selected and erected and designed and installed earthen and bonding. We no longer have what we used to class as EBADS, which was an earth deck potential, uh, earth deck potential bonding and automatic disconnection of supply, but we're now going to have automatic disconnection of supply as our primary means of protection within an installation, but you can't have that unless it's part of an earth deck potential environment. So it was a kind of like, why did you change it in the first place? Was it just to get 80 quid out of us? And these are one of the things that I kind of like about the regs because in one sense it's telling you to do this. It's like being in the Garden of Eden. There's an apple there. You can look at it, just don't touch it. If you touch it, don't pick it. If you pick it, don't bite it. And if you bite it, don't swallow it. If you swallow it, please don't like it. So it's a whole contradiction in the enjoyment that you get from reading these particular books. So that big red rectangle that we can't seem to see the writing on was created in 2008. Then, come in 2011, we had the first amendments to the wiring regulations. What significantly changed with this one was the inclusion and the changing of periodic inspections to electrical installation condition reports. Some people will say that it was just nothing more than a mere change in name. It's exactly the same thing, too much of a blag, just do your job, get on with it. But it wasn't, it was a fundamentally different process. It was much more than just changing the name over from periodic inspection reports to an electrical installation condition reports. It really did look towards addressing some of the issues that there was with inside the industry. We're not talking about the testing companies of the world. We're talking about the one-man balance, the sparkies out there that would give away services like this on domestic properties, especially for free, in order to be able to reap back the benefits from the remedial works that they could find. Okay, that's quite... A bit of a cynic approach, cynical approach, but it was quite true that a lot of these condition reports or periodic inspections back then were used as a blank checkbook to drum up a lot of remedial works which they could then charge for. So by bringing in now what we class as being an installation condition report, we're no longer interested in all the items inside your installation that doesn't comply <coughs> with the regs. We're only interested in the integrity and safety of your installation. We're only bothered about you coming to me with something that actually impairs the integrity and safety of that installation. So let's look at something here, right? We've got a distribution board. It's inside a cupboard, it's got a lock and a key. So you've got a distribution board that's got a padlock on it. It's inside a cupboard that can only be accessed by a key. You can't go in there unless you're an authorised um, personnel. Now inside that distribution board, there's a couple of blanks missing, okay? Under a periodic inspection report, code one every day of the week. No, it exposed life parts, you are all going to die. Okay, which wasn't really quite true, to be fair. So if we looked at it in respect to integrity and safety, yes, there are no blanks or are missing blanks, and it could be potentially hazardous, but it's behind a locked closed door that can only be opened with a key or a suitable tool. It's inside a cupboard which is locked, which can only be opened by a skilled or instructed or an authorised personnel. And then if you look at the electricity at work regulations, you shouldn't be working on or near live equipment unless you've complied with three particular requirements of that piece of legislation. So then where is the danger to the woman sat behind the reception up there? There isn't. So then, am I really going to then say, right, well, there's two blanks missing out of that. I'm now going to give you a remedial quotation and I'm going to charge you 20 quid, 10 pounds for each blank to fit inside that distribution board. And because there's only that there, I'm going to charge you 250 quid for the minimum charge to come out and do it. Do me a favour. It's about looking at things in a measured approach. Also looking at the fact that the book does say that although it may be constructed to an earlier edition of the regulations, it might not comply with today's regulations, doesn't necessarily mean it to be unsafe. And again, integrity and safety, inspection, electrical installation condition report. So periodically inspected, but we're telling you what we feel that your installation is like. Well, not me, but one in general. And then we had a massive amount, and there's that wonderful little sheet that we had, which had a um, little tick sheet that we used to see. That got removed and got replaced with a whole raft of additional items that needed to be inspected and tested. 
And again, which I'm quite surprised it hasn't been addressed in this particular book, is the fact that at that point in time, that a schedule of items to be inspected was only required to be included on a condition report for an installation single and free phase up to 100 amps. The IT released a video with Mark Coles narrating on it to actually point this out during his explanation of the guidance note that at this point in time there are no requirements for installations over 100 amps to have included an items of uh, schedule of items inspected. Now I thought they may have addressed that in this book moving forward, but they haven't. There is still a very comprehensive list inside the wine regulations of items to be inspected during the course of your inspection but there was no requirements for installations over 100 amps to include a schedule of items inspected. And I see put it in the standard. There's nothing wrong with putting it in. Not necessarily a requirement. So, then we come to the third edition of the wine regulations. Now note that I don't actually put the second edition up there. The second edition was a one page document. Uh, it was a coriandum, and it related only to um, Charging vehicles. Now, if you deal with charging vehicles, that's there for you. If you don't deal with charging vehicles, then it was kind of pointless to be able to produce just a full book to include that particular amendment. If you're a member of the IET, it is a pain in the backside to be able to find this coriandum, but you can find it on that website. And if you're a member, you get it for free. If you're not a member, it's even harder to find and you'll pay a five or four on it. But forget it because this third amendment actually has it included with inside as a new um, special location. Okay? So, 2008, we had just over 1,100 regs, uh, 389 pages. Then in 2011, that increased to 463, 1,200 regs. Now, with this particular book, you haven't got a bloody clue. I'm, I'm not going to go through and count every one of these regs, but let's just say that we've actually got 492 pages and a few more regs to boot. Somebody will, no doubt, one day go and count how many regs are in there. I, I would like them to. It would answer that question, but I'm not going to. I've got two kids and a raft of things to do in my spare time rather than sit there and, and go through that book and count them one by one. Now, why all the changes? We touched on that earlier on today. The installations change over time. Okay, we've now got equipment that produce, uh, produce non-linear waveforms on our installation that result in harmonics, that result in all sorts of different things. It's not unusual now through design to actually find that you could, in instances, and we've seen them on distribution boards where you've got them little white yellow stickers that'll say this circuit contains high conductor currents, not just to your earth leakages, dual earthing and so on and so forth. Then it's not unusual, if designed correctly, to find that you have a 2-5 ring circuit in singles, enclosed in conduit or trunking, that will have a 4 mil CPC in order to comply with that regulation, because forget abiotic equations, right? This isn't about disconnection times, it's about mechanical protection. So all these other equations that people come across and stick a 2-5 ring circuit in in singles and do a 2-5 live and 2-5 CPC, or a 2-5 live and a 1-5 CPC, which straight away is wrong that turn around and then try and back it up with some sort of technical blag that they've done an equation, forget it. This is clearly in there when dealing with high circuit conductor currents, it's either four mil when enclosed in mechanical protection or 10 mil if it's free running and taped to either, or not taped, but connected to and secured to either an, an armored cable or any other particular piece of equipment. So when you see them in data cabs and you see them coming from the actual cabs going over to a clean earth bar near the distribution board in order to provide that dual earth path back to point of origin, then that should be no less than 10 mil. If it's a circuit, then so you can find a 2.5 live, a, you can find a 4 mil CPC, but then you can also probably find an even different cross-sectional area for the neutral conductor, depending on how many or what effect the harmonics are going to have on that particular circuit, if calculated and designed correctly to the book gets completely and utterly bleeding minefield, but that's just the way that this book works, and it's just the way that we look towards installing some of the installations that we have at present within the UK. So, this is why it all changes. There is an organisation out there called the IEC, the International Electoral Technical Committee. They meet once every, I think it's three weeks or so, something on the lines, and they're made up of representatives from America, North America, South America, Australasia, China, Europe, all the different main players around the world, and they all get together and they talk about what's affecting and what's happening in their particular region, what's relevant to them, 
and how can they look towards creating this wonderful global standard that we all work towards. That surprised me, that we all have a global standard of electrical safety. Because when I go to Spain, to Torremolinos, and the mobile electrician that's on a call out doesn't turn up in a wonderfully coloured painted van with toe detectors and snicker pants with your flappy pockets and your eye visors and your hard hats and he's got the ladders and he's got all the correct equipment. It's just some old fella with a pair of dirty boots and jeans and a t-shirt and a leather satchel that walks across with the great, biggest bloody A-frame, wooden A-frame on wheels that I've ever seen, puts the brakes on it, climbs up to it, unplugs the fuse in the middle of the street, changes it, plugs it back on, gets down and walks off. I think, how can we possibly be all working to the same standards? Because none of us do that. And if any of you have been over to Portugal or Turkey recently and you have a look at it, do you marvel at the installation or the, the, the standard? Well, you probably won't do because you're not as sad as me. But do you ever look at and think, Good God, we do exactly the same thing at home. We hang off that pillar over there, cutting away with our little junior axle to try and tap off that box in order to find some, put some power to a, a newly built room in our house. But allegedly we have an international standard, a global standard that we all work towards. And it's created by a group of members that all meet together at the International Electrical Technical Committee, who then every now and again turn around and pass their wisdom down to their relevant regional partners. Over here, in Europe, we're governed by an organisation called CENLEC. I did know it, I don't know it. I'm going to say that the last bit has something to do with electrical and I won't be so far off. But they take everything that the International Electrical Technical Committee give them and then they pass it down to all their relevant European partners to go and work towards a single standard. Now, I've got to say with this, when I looked at, because we're lucky, we do, we do a bit across Northern Europe every now and again, and we also go to Southern Ireland, that when you look at the European version of this, it looks more or less bang on, to be honest. Even when it comes down to, you know, flicking through and looking at the contents page, it's more or less bang on. The only thing is that every chapter uh, or every part of their particular wine regulations is an individual book in itself and it costs an absolute fortune. So they'll come across with a set of standards and this is probably one of the reasons why it took so long for this to actually be released because when I think back about 18 months ago it was rumoured that the, the Third Amendment was due to be released then but there was a lot of wrangling over something as simple as numbering because we are, in, well, we are inherently British, well, we are British, you know, we like to keep all of that last bastion of Britishness that we have. We like ring circuits, they can't get their heads around it. But we don't want to give up ring circuits, so we need to find a way of being able to differentiate our UK specific regulations from the European harmonised document that's been placed about. So they'll come across with all the information that's been provided to them by the International Electrical Technical Committee and they'll pass it down to UK. And there is an organisation, a group of people, called JPEL64. And JPEL64 are noted in the front of the book and it's made up, this technical committee, of the best and the brightest that our country has to offer. We've got people from BEMA, which have had a profound effect on some of the changes to this particular book, which we'll talk about lately, down to the Electrical Contractors Association, to which I'm a member and uh, chairman of the Central Lancashire Black Pill and the Files. Um, and also the NIC, we've got the Health and Safety Executive, we've got the London Fire Authority that again have had a massive input on what's changed in this particular book. So you can see there's a list of people that all get together on a very regular basis and they will sit there and they will talk about everything that they've been given down from CENLEC and from the IEC and then in conjunction with the BSI and the IEC then formulate the regulations which will then be given to us as sparkies to be able to adopt into place into our installations and that will then lead us to the wire regulations that we work to today. So there's a whole chain of events that go down in order to be able to get to that particular book. Because sometimes something as simple as changing a number over can delay the release of a book by only enough 15 to 18 months, say. So there is a lot that goes into it. It's all done with the best of intentions. It's all done for a reason. It's all done for a reason. That reason is to make sure that we stay as safe as we can, especially in the design thing. Is this, this book is for design. The testing side of this is about six pages. Probably one of the most important parts of any electrical installation is to perform regular maintenance that we've been discussing today. But it's only given six pages. We'll get all the different. Now this, 
what I've got a raft of stuff here to talk through today and uh, it's more so than when we were doing this before Christmas before Christmas all of us were doing these presentations based on a draft publication that was put out for public comment now we've got the proper book there the, 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 the guidance notes 3 has just been released so I've not even broken a spine on it um, guidance notes 1 has been released none of the other guidance notes have been produced and although this has now been released doesn't come into effect until July this year. Okay? There are parts of this book that don't come into effect until January next year. There's going to be a lot of questions asked backwards and forwards as to how we are to implement quite a substantial part of this book. So watch this space. Not just this, but all manner of um, outlets that can produce the information that we need from, which I think is a really good one for you to subscribe to, which is nothing to do with us, by the way, the Wiring Matters magazine from the IET website. It's fantastic. People like Jeff Cronshaw, um, who's one of the technical, which is one of the senior electrical engineers for the IET that gets involved in penning a lot of these guidance notes to Mark Coles from the IET, who's a technical director. They produce what's called wiring matters and they do it on a monthly basis or is it a quarterly basis I think it's like summer spring autumn or winter and it's got great information in there and not just about electrics as well it's covering all sorts of wiring matters containment cable fire the lot and it's free and it's brilliant so there's going to be a lot of information coming out to be able to clarify some of the things that we're going to talk about today back down to getting it like I said, continual development, what you know today, 50% of that in 18 months time will be obsolete. So in six months time, some of the stuff that we may talk about today will have been expanded on and changed and probably amendments or a colony ending produced in order to be able to clarify or to dispel some of the things that they once put out. Begs the question, why didn't they get this right before they actually produced the book? But I guess they had to start and get it going. So, first thing that's changed, numbers. As we talked about previously, or just a couple of seconds ago, the numbering system. For you people that deal with electrical installations, it doesn't mean a great deal to you, I would say. For those that deal with training, who are lecturers, tutors, or if you're a test engineer that are expected to produce a regulation next to any observation that you provide in order for A, the qualifying supervisor to be able to assess what you're talking about and see whether you're on the right track, or for Sparkies, or other people that are electrically minded to be able to refer back to the book to see whether you agree with what they're talking about or not, then it's back to school. You need to understand that the green book, if you've got one, take it out of its wrapper, look at it, put it in a bin. Because the numbering system inside here is no longer relevant. I've got to say, you have, like I said, when it comes into effect in July, up until July, you have the choice to work to this book or to that book. You can't cross and mismatch. You can't pick bits out of here you like and pick bits out of there you like. You must pick your choice of weapon. I would say, just read this, look at the information that's being provided, understand the changes and what it's going to mean to you, and stick to this until you have to. You've got six months to understand this better. I'm going to put these down. I feel like I'm on a runway, taxiing in a plane. So stick to the green book for the time being. If you haven't got it out of its plastic wrapper, do so, have a look at it, and then get somebody who knows what they're talking about to do with it on your behalf, I would say, because it'll just pickle your head. If you've not looked at it yet, then don't bother starting now. But number changes. At present, the way that we were able to differentiate between UK-specific regulations and European harmonised regulations are all UK-specific regs were given and demonstrated by using a 100 numbering system. Europe wanted to change that. They wanted to do something different. We didn't want to give this up. Wrangle, wrangle, wrangle. We want what we know and what we like, and we don't want to change these things. To and fro in, to and fro in. After a while, there was some sort of compromise. So now, all European harmonised regulations are given a 100 numbering system. Now, as you can see, now this regulation up here, you would say is a global thing, as Dave was touching on before. Bare live conductors shall be installed in insulators. The house must not touch live exposed parts. Don't matter which part of the country you're in, that's still going to stand, isn't it, to be fair. Don't matter which part of Europe you're in, we don't want you touching live exposed parts. So now, all European harmonised documentation is done using a 100 numbering system. All UK-specific regulations, and if the colouring on this 
projector was better, then you would see that most of these have been highlighted in a different colour to be able to demonstrate when we're going through these particular eggs. But all 200 numbering systems now relate to UK specific regulations only. Accessories, 1363, so we're talking 13 amp plug tops, may be supplied through a ring final circuit. We love them, they hate them. A lot of things that we do, they just don't get their heads around. But we're not giving them up because we believe, you know, we are quite good at being able to maintain and to design really safe, strong and reliable systems in this country. Competence. I'm looking forward to seeing clarification on this. And I'm looking forward to seeing clarification on this for a reason. And we'll, we'll be able to get this reason because I'm now going to talk about it in its bare bones sort of description. Beforehand, we touched on this the other day, didn't we? Competence. Inside the 16th edition, competence is, is defined as an individual with practical skill and technical knowledge for the nature of work that he or she is carrying out to perceive and to avoid potential risks that electricity can create. So you just need to have technical skill or technical knowledge, sorry, and practical skill. So I sit you down and I just give you a little talk and this is giving you technical knowledge, hasn't it really, to be fair, you've not needed to do any particular qualification. So when you're looking at Sparkies that are doing pack testing, they can probably turn around and say they've got technical knowledge because you know, they've read a book about it and they've been doing it for years, to be fair. So you know, I've got old boy Sparkies that have been testing, that have been in the field for like 40, 50 years, that probably know about, more about electrics than probably say, I'm going to, don't lynch me, than say a third of this room. I'm just seeing how many of my staff are here that can constitute to be in that third. But probably have more knowledge of electrics than say a third of the people in this room, but yet struggle to be able to do a City and Guilds exam. So therefore, they've still got technical knowledge. But now it changes. Come July the 1st, and I should really get some of those little sticky notes in here. Competence has been deleted. And we are now, see skilled and instructed, classed as being a skilled and instructed person. Technical knowledge, skilled. Okay, that says adequate training and education. So let's remove this. And then we go to the definition being skilled person electrically is what you shall be deemed as. And that means it's a person who possesses as appropriate to the nature of the work that they are undertaking, adequate education, training and practical skill and who is able to perceive risks and avoid hazard which electricity can create. Adequate training and practical skill. Okay, 2005, we had the creation of part pay, domestic installers. There was a raft of domestic installer schemes that popped up out of the woodwork. There was a raft of courses that could take an individual and train them for say four weeks or four days and then give them the ability to be a domestic installer and go out and to wire properties. There'll be those that think that that's damaged our industry. There'll be me and others that will think, okay, it's not perfect. However, before the creation of the Part P, we had nothing. So we had people that could run down to B&Q, buy a load of cable, fling on the Superman capes and the knickers over the top of the pants on a weekend, then go and do some kitchen install, as they are kitchen installers, and then just not even certify it or pass it off. So even with the creation of this, it has improved and changed and brought it up ever so slightly. But then we started seeing these people really, really getting ahead of themselves and thinking that they are electrically qualified to be able to go out and to start doing things like condition reports and to pass judgments on other people's installations that have been constructed and designed by people that have been doing the job for like 30, 40 years. We've got people in and I'm going to leave the domestic installers alone for the time being because I don't want to give them a hard time because they do a very, very tough job. But you've got industrial electricians that work on production plants, that work on, um, well, yeah, work on production plants, big conveyor belt systems, and then you've got relays, solenoids, you've got all sorts of contactors, you've got a whole raft of equipment that wouldn't necessarily be good at wiring up a domestic house because they've never seen a piece of twin and earth in their life. You've got lads that do their electrical apprenticeship at British Aerospace that wouldn't know what a piece of twin and earth was if it slapped them across the face like a wet kipper. 
So as appropriate to the nature of work that they're carrying out, you must demonstrate relevant or as appropriate undertaking adequate education, training and practical skill. If you're a sparky carrying out pack testing and something goes wrong, it could be perceived that I'm going to say to you, okay, so you've carried out that test. Can you show me the documentation, which means that you've exercised due diligence enough to be able to denote that you are classed as being electrically skilled for that job that you've carried out? Cheeky sods. I'm sparky. I've got a GRB gold card. I've been doing this for four years. Well, I've been trained for four years and I've been, doing, I've been in the game for 15. Yeah, but you've never gone and sat any, not even a 65 pound online two hour competency course in portable, I forget portable pines, in service inspection of electrical equipment. So how do you know what you're doing? Give over, I'm a sparky. No, you're not electrically skilled. Hotels, we've got maintenance people that have changed over sockets and switches for years, they're not sparkies, they've just changed over sockets and switches, it's a socket. It's like what you do at home. But, come July, are they considered to be electrically skilled? Do they have relevant education and training to be able to perceive and to avoid hazard which electricity can create? Not all electricians are created equally. Just because you're a domestic installer doesn't mean you are competent to be able to do maintenance electrical work. Would I have somebody, I've got lads that, are, that have gone through their 2391 and they've done all the qualifications known to man as far, and they're quite young, so they've done the whole, you know, the now it's called mod tech or whatever it is, 2330 or whatever we moved on to now. That I've never seen a piece of pyro in their life. I'd never stick them in an industrial installation to make off an MI pot, because you haven't done it. So are they electrically skilled for the nature of work that they're undertaking? You get my point. One size doesn't fit all. It's for the work that you are qualified and experienced and technically skilled to be able to carry out. Now, the practical aspects of it, the practical skill, we're not quite sure how you demonstrate that. Maybe we may see the creation of some sort of MVQ to actually demonstrate that over a two year period, you have filled in a competency logbook to be able to denote that you are electrically skilled at that particular job. For those of us that are old enough and have been doing it long enough, we might have some sort of granddad rights to just go and do an MVQ, fill out the logbook and just get it done. Um, like that as we have at this present moment in time with the MBQ Level 3. If you've qualified so many years ago, then we're not going to assess you on site. You fill in your evidence, give us your cases, put it together, and that will deem satisfactory to be able to deem you competent at that particular part of your job. So we're not quite sure how this is going to be measured. What did the classes adequate training and qualifications? Yes, GIB, yes, City and Guilds, yes, EAL, but it doesn't tell you that. It could be something that your company puts together as a mixture of things like um, safe isolation courses, electrical awareness, all sorts of different things that you can demonstrate as part of your skills matrix that you now possess sufficient education and training and you have the technical skill to be deemed as being electrically skilled. So again, this one, not quite sure yet, but you can see where the confusion can come. I've got to check up on it, but if memory serves me right, an NIC QS does not have to hold the electrical 2391 or now 9495 qualification. Never has. May have changed it. I think they're looking at changing the qualifications for QSs in NIC companies. But if that's true, and on July the 1st, we have skilled electrically persons who possess as appropriate to the nature of electrical work that's being undertaken, adequate training, education and practical skill, how can you be a QS of an organisation that signs off other people's cert certificates and actually stands above those that are installing and checking all the paperwork that comes through your company's door if you do not, if you do not have a minimum of either an EAL Level 3 in inspection and testing or an equivalent like a City and Guilds? Because you're signing it off, aren't you? But you don't have the adequate training and education relevant for the nature of work that you're carrying out. All your other lads out in the field might do, but you might be completely unqualified to be able to carry that work. Do you then fall outside the scope of what is to be deemed as electrically skilled? Don't know, we'll find out. We've got six months before this book comes into play. So, competency is gone. You're no longer considered to be competent. You are, or will be, considered to be skilled electrically. Okay? Semen, reduced values. ZS values that we have, okay, excerpts from the wiring matters, and every, every day there's more stuff that comes out. So this, although the slides stay the same, there are you know, changes to what goes on. So, 
seeming values are the minimum value. We've reduced the maximum ZSs basically in the book in line with the requirements for the electrical safety, quality and continuity regulations 2002. And it's the factor which takes into account the effects of voltage of electricity supply to an installation varying, on, varies, which varies depending on the time, place, changes to transformer taps and other considerations. Let's look at this, right? So you change the transformer taps. In fact, let's bring it back to basics. In Europe, we work on a nominal voltage of 230 degrees plus 6% minus 10%. Who here measures voltage on their installations? As an, electric, as an electrician. Anybody? Nobody? You? Great. How many times have you measured? I'm glad you said that or else I'm going to look like a mong. Right. How many times have you measured 230 volts? Okay. So what sort of voltages do we get on our installations? Yeah. Any, any increase on 240? You have 230 straight across. You've got some sort of voltage regulator. Higher 230s. We recorded 255 the other day on a volt, and you've got a smile on your face. What do you get? 220. Yeah, we're at volts. Oh, you, you've got your old voltage regulation. Right? Well, we'll take these out of the equation, right? Because you were just put here to wind <laughs> me up. Those that don't have voltage regulation that standardise the voltage at a constant 220 volts. Thank you, gents. Um, we have things like 255 volts at point of origin, right? Because we've we've got they've just done some work on the transformer taps, which has affected the actual readings that you're going to get. Now, this can have uh, a negative effect on the electronic equipment inside the installation. But then when we're looking at the testing side of things, depending on what time of day you actually conduct your test, whether it be in the morning, when it's quiet, will be different from when it's in the middle of the day, under load conditions. The heat generated under load conditions, the heat has an adverse effect or has a direct effect on the resistivity of a length of copper cable, can then differ uh, can change the readings that you get when you conduct that loop impedance test. It can be at night time, it could be in winter, it could be in summer. Do you get my point? There are so many different factors there which are going to lead to you getting different results. Whereabouts on that sinusoidal wave, this easy shaky jakey that Dave alluded to before, wherever you hit that button will give you a different reading. So they've given you a seeming value of 0.95%. Which reduces the maximum loop impedance of these particular devices in order to meet disconnection times in the event of a fault. <clears throat> so at the moment, for our BS7, so the 60898, we've got, as you see here, what you would normally see inside this particular book. Maximum loop impedances, as prescribed. And it's also important to note that these are generic values. And again, we're getting back down to the whole sort of like working in a measured fashion on an installation. They are generic values. They've been put together, consulted. A lot of people have gone to great trouble to be able to give us these values. But if we exceed the values of these measured loop impedances, they're going to come running to you screaming, is it a cold one or a cold two? I think really the better way of being able to approach this would be then to look at it exceeds the maximum loop impedance. So let's go back to the manufacturer's data that we have as test engineers and have a look and see, does it exceed the recommendations from the, ma the manufacturer's data? If it does, then bring it to your attention. If it doesn't, and it's still in the required tolerances of the manufacturer's information, then therefore you've been alerted to the generic data that we've been given inside this book. You've cross-referenced it against the manufacturer's data. It doesn't exceed, so therefore it doesn't impair integrity and safety. And it might just warrant some sort of inclusion at the bottom of page two as it does exceed the, uh, the, the values that are written inside the books. But on further investigation, we've denoted that there is no particular issue to your installation <coughs> at this time. So going just straight off, well, it's exceeding 1.44, I'm going to scream that you're all going to be electrocuted, isn't necessarily the right way to go about it unless you want to be able to trouble up additional business by insisting that we install some RCBOs in to give you additional protection. But that's a, a monetary sort of thing rather than a measured sort of approach. So on here, you have a list of, and I'm going to put up here a little formula, you've got a table of values to meet disconnection times of 0.4 seconds to 5 seconds of inside the regs for 60898 and 61009s, the RCBOs. Okay. At the end of those particular columns, you have a little formula which 46 divided by IN that you can use to be able to find the loop impedance of any particular device that you have in your installation or that you're wanting to install. 
because you might have a list of generic values and generic breakers inside that particular book, but you may come across something like a 2 amp MCB. So on a type B MCB, 2 amp, what's the maximum loop impedance? Using a formula at the end of the line, which is 46 divided by IN, you replace that IN with the breaker or the rating of that particular device that you're looking to find. And I use two because it's simple and because that's just me. So 46 divided by two is going to give us 23 ohms. So that would be the maximum loop impedance that you would expect to be able to get on that particular circuit protected by a two amp MCB. Okay, leave that there. Dead easy it was. Now we've reduced them. We've applied a 0.9, or not well, times it by 0.95, and we now have reduced the values. So straight away, two, three, we've got a reduced M, so we've got a reduced loop impedance of 1.37 for that particular B type 32 amp MCB, which has brought it down to be able to take into consideration all those different variances. This changes ever so slightly. At the end of it, you'll find there is a new formula. And that formula reads as 230 divided by 0.95 divided by five times the IN, which is the breaker that you're looking for. It's all there for you to be able to find. Don't need to write all this down. Makes it a little bit simpler that 230 times 0.95 gives us 218. Divide that by IN5, and in this case we'll use a 32 amp as an example, so 32 times 5 gives us 160, so 218 divided by 160 gives us around about 1.365 ohms. So if you look about the tabulated values that have been brought to your attention, which is 1.37, it's not so far off. So using that, you will never, on these particular MCBs, have to worry about the fact that they don't have that MCB in the table. How the bloody hell am I going to find out what the leap impedance is for that particular device? By using a formula that they place at the end of that particular table, you can work it all out. Then, using Appendix 14, which talks about this 80% rule of thumb, what used to be a 75% rule of thumb, which is now a value placed inside your book, you can then add, or you can times this by 0.8, to simulate the effects of heat generated on a circuit or an installation under no load conditions. So if you're designing it and you measure and you calculate, and that's my loop impedance. Now it's only theoretical, so I'm now going to apply Appendix 14 to that. This is what will happen to that circuit should it be under load conditions and there is a fault. If you're testing a live installation, there's no real need to apply this 80% because it's under load conditions already. Obviously, if you're testing it out of hours or on a weekend and it's not under load conditions and therefore you will then apply it to be able to see what would happen on the results that you've been able to obtain if it was under load conditions, the heat that's generated and the fault that, that could occur. Okay, so in essence, really, in a nutshell, it's just that they've, re they've reduced the maximum loop impedance down in order to be able to take into consideration a great deal of variances that can affect the installation on a day-to-day -day basis or on a, an hourly basis. Right, now then, London Fire Authority. Two instances we've inside this, uh, wire regulations that the London Fire, Authority, London Fire Authority have got involved with. This particular part regarding escape routes was down to the fact that several firefighters had lost their lives trying to escape installations after going in looking for people. Okay, uh, reasons for the new regulations that wiring systems, sorry, the purpose of this regulation is to improve safety of firefighters in other, uh, and others in escape routes under fire conditions. The wiring systems that drop and hang across escape routes due to failure of means of support in fire conditions have, potential, have the potential to entangle people. In recent years, a number of firefighters have died as a result of being entangled in this way. So what we're asking for is to make sure that all wiring systems and escape routes are constructed in a way that they will not drop down prematurely in the event of a fire. Okay, I've got some of these to pass out to have a look at for those of you. There you go. Be careful with them. They're not toys. I don't want you stabbing each other with them or me. Here we go. A couple of these. What's a wiring system? 
What constitutes to a wiring system? Yeah, it's cool. You've probably seen them before. At present, many installations are put together. Um, you have your cable tray, you have your conduit, you have um, trunking, etc., etc. But you also find that across the suspended ceiling, especially in commercial installations, people will use PVC cable ties. And they were like, he's smiling, so he does. All right, straight away. And he's probably going to smile more at this. You can even go to the wholesaler and you can get, and it's amazing. I, I, I don't see it written on it, but they, they swear to me it is. You can get locking off tape, okay? And you can get fixing tape. And these fixing tapes come in a variety of colours, right? You can get black fixing tape. You can get brown fixing tape. You can get grey fixing tape. You can even get stripy green and yellow fixing tape. It's wonderful. Cost pennies, they come in a big batch like this. It has the word insulation on there, but if you look at it from a different angle, it says it's not insulation tape, it's fixing tape or and or locking off tape. So when you are doing construction jobs in a domestic, not a domestic, in a commercial environment that has a suspended ceiling with them drop downs, then you can get this fixing tape. And as long as it doesn't touch the grid, you can actually use this tape to keep the cables on the drop downs and keep them off the suspended ceiling. Wrong, it's insulation tape. Many times you'll go to a distribution board and find them using this locking off tape, especially the green and yellow stuff, over the MCBs while they're going testing, they'll flick it off, they'll put this locking off tape on, that's an adequate means of isolation, and then they'll go off and they'll do their job. Tape can be taken off, breaker can be flipped back on, and we know what can happen. So, whether it be PVC cable ties, whether it be locking off or fixing tapes, which it's not, because it is insulation tape and that's all it should be used for, although it doesn't, we should ensure that installations, regardless, wiring systems and escape routes, are to be constructed in a manner that do not fall down prematurely in the event of fire. What's an escape route? Anybody want to give me an example of what an escape route is? Evacuation route. Okay, I'll do that. I'll have an evacuation That's an escape route. That one over there. <coughs> That's an escape route. Then again, where you're sat is an escape route. Where you're sat is an escape route. And where you're sat over there is an escape route. Because all of you have got to get to them escape routes. Now, we had a gentleman that sat one of these courses that got quite irate. I think he had a bit of a bad day with a fire officer. And he says, you're scaremongering, talking rubbish. I disagree with you, full stop. Not having it. I've got a group of very qualified, experienced um, design engineers in my company. And we specify design routes, where we, we specify excess routes, we specify fire routes, we, we specify how to get out of these buildings. So what you're talking about is an absolute pile of rubbish. And I'm afraid I just disagree with you. Thinking, okay, if I don't write this stuff, so this is all put together using a whole raft of information, I'm sitting on NIC one day courses, etc., etc., And it will talk about, where are we? Let me have a look for escape routes. What constitutes to an escape route is a route designated for escape to a place of safety in the event of an emergency. But escape routes may include not only defined routes, such as corridors, stairways and hallways, but also open areas through which escaping people, persons, might reasonably be expected to need to pass on their way to a place of safety. So that's everything. Okay. Now... At another seminar, we had somebody shout out, but what about data cables? Swines, has anybody here do data installations first? I should have said that before, I said they were swines. No, great, the swines. Because you'll put your installation together, and I'm really sorry, I don't mean any disrespect to data installers, but you'll put an installation together and it'll be wonderful, and then these data installers with the trainers and the jeans and the t-shirts will come in, and you're all snickered up with your boots on and your eyebrows, and they'll get the ladders on and they'll get the biggest bunch. You're, you do this all the time, you or something, because you just have the cheekiest little smirk on your face. And he's putting his head down in shame. <laughs> Yeah, and they'll just get him and it will be lasso king and it'll go from A to B straight across. And then you may be lucky if they use a fixing tape on the drops, they'll just leave it sometimes hanging on the suspended ceiling. But then this entire area is an escape route. And you've still got to get out of that. 
But data cables don't fall inside the requirements of the wiring regulations. Well, yes, they do, because they're a wiring system. Well, they don't carry electric power or current, so they're not part of the electricity at work regulations. Oh, but yes, they do. No, they don't, did they do? You go and put that innocuous little bit of cable in, tag it into a patch panel, put yourself an RJ45 socket on the other end. Then I come along and bring myself a data switch, and plug it in, and that data switch provides power over Ethernet. So therefore, my desk, sock, uh, my desk phones don't need an external power source because it's been provided by power over Ethernet, which provides current and voltage, which then falls into the electricity at work regulations, which intrinsically finds itself linked and included with inside the requirements of the wiring regulations and should be constructed as such. So all wiring systems in escape routes, and escape routes we've now just talked about, whether we like it or not, as being everything that you see, because even if you do dis um, define escape routes as a designer, the minute you walk off site, this data installer's got to come in, it's got nothing to do with you, we're filling the cables from A to B. So therefore, everything is an escape route, and all wiring systems need to be constructed in a way that they are not going to fall down prematurely in the event of a fire. Now, does that mean you can't use conduit or trunking? You can use plastic trunking. You've just got to make sure that the cables inside that plastic trunking are fixed intermittently by a means which is not going to prematurely collapse in the event of a fire. Okay? Somebody mentioned about conduit. Now, does that mean that you can't use plastic saddles on uh, steel wide armoured? It's plastic melts. I'd say so. So, does that mean you can use them? They get the, the cable cleats that you get. Have a look at it. Cable management systems. Just talk about here uh, metal cable, uh, using metal cable management systems such as steel conduit trunking or cable tray or metal casings of a buzz bar trunking system. Uh, there's all sorts of references in here to be talked about when it comes to plastic um, conduit systems throughout installations and how better to be able to protect them from falling down. That may melt, but what about the actual cables inside? Have you got some sort of fire rating bracket that will prevent them from falling down? Now here, over on this side, it's a fire alarm installation. And if the colour was a little bit better, you would note that it would, it would look like a very neat cable installation. One that I would be incredibly proud of if I was the person that installed this particular part of the installation. But none of them cables here are fixed using anything other than PVC cable, uh, PVC cable ties. So in the event of a fire, if one of them goes, a lot of that's coming crashing down. If you're stood underneath that when that comes crashing down, you ain't getting out. Okay, let's put a little bit of reality into it. If you're stood underneath that and it comes crashing down in the event of a fire, that crashing on your head is the least of your problems because you're going to be dead anyway. Because the fire is going to be that bad. So we've got to look at a little bit of common sense. All right, I am sort of like sexing it up to say that if this clicks off here, this is all going to go crazy. You are never going to get out. But really, to be honest, if you're still underneath that when that comes crashing down, I wouldn't concern yourself too much with plastic cable ties. You should be already out of the building. But it comes down to the fact that when we're talking to engineers or we're talking to people on site and we're talking about safety or toolbox talks or anything like that, one of the things that is an absolute bugbear of mine is signing in and signing out from site. If you don't sign in and don't sign out from site, I get particularly grumpy for absolute for, for reasons which I'm sure you're all aware of. That if you don't sign out, this is what I say to our young uns. If you don't sign out, you'll be sat at home, you'll be on your PS3, you'll earn a couple of quid playing FIFA for cash, you've got your headphones on, you're chatting to somebody in Venezuela, your phone's going off, bowl of cereal, you can't hear your phone. I'm on the phone saying, Where are you? Where are you? Not answering. As far as the fire brigade are concerned, you're upstairs on the fifth floor underneath the cabinet. So in they go. So obviously you've, you've got out of the way. But in they go, looking for you, who sat at home eating your cereal, playing on FIFA, no knowledge at all that we're looking for you because you haven't signed out. So later on, you finish your game, you look down, got this call, pick it up. Hi, what's up? Why didn't you sign out? Oh shit, I forgot. Well, I'm really, really sorry to tell you this, but you're now gonna live for the rest of your life with the knowledge that two firefighters went into a burning building looking for you and they haven't come out. Not a nice thing to live with, is it? And generally, not all the time, 
But a reason why this was placed in is because they couldn't get out because cables fell across their escape routes, entangled them, prevented them from getting back out. So you're a daft sod for not signing out, but the installation that was constructed has led to the untimely exit of those firefighters that were just doing their job. All wiring systems, I'll say again, we can use things like this. These metal cable clips that we've given to you, these cable ties, little tool, ratchet them together. No, they don't need earthing. Okay, I've had that one before. And no, they don't need grommets around and stop them from cutting into cables. But you can also use things like basket, conduit, metal conduit, trunking, a whole manner of fire resistant equipment to be able to prevent cables from dropping down. Look like you're about to come up with a question. So you're basically, you're saying you've got a retrofit. Uh, uh, now, all this it. is it, you see? Yeah. This is it. So, when we look at, although not constructed to the current edition of the wire regulations, does not necessarily mean that the installation is considered to be unsafe. So, we come into an installation, and we'll touch on this with condition reports as well. And we pop our head above there and we see this wonderful fixing tape or a couple of plastic cable ties that have been used. Then we're going to throw it down there as being probably a recommended improvement. You've then got to make a judgment in your own mind based on the information that you have to hand as to whether that requires additional money to be spent on it to be able to create an installation which is not going to impair the safety of the firefighters or individuals trying to escape a burning building. So am I going to come in and say it's a cold one? Very much doubt it. You shouldn't really ever see C1s on your reports anyway because they're immediately dangerous. There's a C1 on your report, it should be followed up at the end of it with an electrical danger notice. I'm going to say to you, there's a C1 on your site, it needs to be dealt with before I leave site. You can either have us do it or you can get one of your maintenance cases, but if you don't deal with it before I leave site, so I'm going to put a C1 on your report and you're going to get in your email an electrical danger notice. Because you can take a horse to water, you can't make it drink. So retrospectively, you're going to look at it on a condition report basis. The severity will very much be determined on what the inspector finds. If he opens up and has a poke above here and it's just an absolute, you can't lift the ceiling tiles up and we know this happens again. Lifts can't lift the ceiling tiles up because of the weight of the, the Cat 5A and the Cat 6 cables that are lying on top of it along with a mixture of some bell wire. We've got some FPs in there. We've probably even got a bit of steel wide armoured, a small steel wide armoured, which is just at that point in time being led on top of the ceiling. Then maybe we're going to turn around and say, listen, I think we've got a bit of an issue here and we're going to give it and warrant, we're going to give it the attention that it deserves. Now, yes, things need to be done, but you've always got to look at that you can, can you have the right every day of the week to object to and to object and to disagree with what's placed inside any report that's given to you. All the HSC are going to look for is basically, I've got a list of observations. You've got your certificates to say I've dealt with items one, two, three, and four. You've got a couple of pieces of paper that you've wrote out to say, well, this doesn't actually require a minor work certificate because it's not actually electrical, but it's been flagged up. So this is a document to say, it's like a work order, if you will, that I've dealt with five, six, seven, and eight. But nine, 10, 11, and 12, we ain't doing. Well, why not? Because we disagree with it. Why do we disagree with it? You're an electrical-minded individual, so you're going to put down a well-constructed, well-documented argument to say, well, we don't agree with it because of the measures that have been put in place and because of X, Y, Z. And they're going to turn around and say, thank you very much. OK, you've done your job. But you can't do is go back to the contract and say, I disagree with you, I want it taken off my report. Because if you get that call wrong and I got it right, my arse is in a slink. But again, it's down to retrospective, measured response, I would say, more than anything else. It's like a communal area, and obviously it's it's more important than a, Absolutely. a, a room that's hardly ever occupied. Mm -hmm. so, you know, yeah. so you're going to look at the area in which that particular installation has been created, look at the recommendations or look at the items that have been brought to your attention as a result of that report and make an informed judgment as to where you move forward. I know I sound quite political, I'm sitting on the fence, it'd be great to say, no, we've got to get it done, I'll charge you for it, but it's not the point. It's a case you've got to look at is everything has got to be judged on its own merit. Everything's got to be judged on its own merit based on what you believe to be the right course of action for your installation because it's you that's doing everything that you can with your ability and your knowledge to, to, uh, to create and maintain safe environments. Okay. Any other questions on this bit? Are we okay with that for the time being? There'll be more information coming out with this. There'll be more questions that are being asked. 
There's a lot of things when we went down to have a look at, uh, when Dave went down to a tech talk recently that had technical directors there from organisations that were very much involved and London Fire Authority, although they tell us what it would be classed as um, escape routes inside the wiring matters, when asked in an open conference, we're very fuzzy and kind of evaded being able to give the questions. There's still a lot here that hasn't quite been pushed forward. This is at the time already, don't time flying when you're having fun. <coughs> right, auxiliary circuits. Who works with auxiliary circuits here? <coughs> okay. Auxiliary circuits, in the wiring regulations at present, you were given a paragraph about how to make sure that under fault conditions it doesn't uh, make exposed and live parts live. Okay, that's been removed. You've now got five pages of requirements inside the regulations to ensure that your auxiliary circuits now comply with all the requirements laid out inside that book. From a domestic point of view, what would consider to be a very common auxiliary circuit? A boiler. As a sparky working with your mate, and you turn around to me and say, just give me a spec. That is quite in depth, like with the, with the, with the actual um, auxiliary circuits. There is quite a lot in there and it does get quite technical, so we're going to skirt over that. But if you do work with wiring circuits, there will be more coming out on this. And like I said, you know, we could do full days and, and two days on the wiring regs itself. Okay. Certification. Installation certificates, if you're doing condition reports, it won't be that difficult to get your head around this particular part. Um, now, let me just get some of this up here. Now, at the moment, we've got this sheet on here that we all know and love, and I think it's pretty decent, to be honest. Um, but it has been removed, and we are now looking at three additional pages of items to be inspected during initial verification. Installation certificates. It's quite important to actually say that while I was talking about condition reports not requiring items uh, or a schedule of items inspected on installations over 100 amps, forget it. On this one, it's across all. It makes no difference the size, type, domestic, industrial, commercial, whatever. It's, it's increased substantially. You've gone from what used to be 44 items to 120 items. It includes the electrical intake position. You can argue that the wiring regulations deal with the consumer side of the electrical installation and we do not concern ourselves with the supply side, we're not allowed to cut the tags off, etc., etc. But they're saying that while you're there, look at it, it does clearly tell us inside the wiring regulations that we need to make sure that all existing uh, equipment, safety measures, etc., etc., are in place and will not be impaired by any work that you're carrying out. So while you're there, make comments on it. Especially in domestic properties, how many in here, how many of you in here have had your house tested recently that haven't bought a house? Really? None of you? You buy a car? I'm not listening to you, I'm just saying it for effect. Um, have you recently? Oh, right, that's different, yeah. But I mean, if you're living in your property and you've been there for a while, you buy a car, you spend a fortune on a car sometimes, right? You've got MOTs, you've got services, you, you check that when you get in, you, you, your tyres are all right, you've got water antifreeze, you sometimes have winter tyres on. With a house, we bash walls, we fling cables. If you remember watching Brookside and you had uh, that, 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 the, the, the quintessential scouser, Teddy with the curly hair and the moustache, and his missus got out the bath and she touched the light switch at the top of the stairs and it blew her down the stairs and she died because people go out to B&Q by all these electrical sockets and switches and you know we put our capes on we are oh, an Englishman's house is his castle and we'll be damned if we're told what we can and we can't do and we'll go and put all these things on not necessarily knowing what we're doing and some of these can have adverse effects the amount of times I've had people ring me up saying my old fella's been to B&Q he's bought a lovely fitting he's put it up in the front room and it won't switch off I'm just sat there thinking Loop in, loop out, it's got all the reds thrown in one connector and it's got all the blue blacks and he's thrown it into another connector and he's not realised that one of them blacks and reds have been used for a live and switch live and now we can't switch it off. Oh, it's not, sorry, twin reds. Go live and I know that would be, be horrible. Because when you buy a fitting from B&Q, you've only got three connectors, you've only got three wires, so he thinks he's great, puts it up and I get a phone call and it's an easy 20 quid which then gets declared to the HMRC because that would be wrong. Um, 
but it's, it's a straightforward job. But you see how things happen in domestic properties. So we've got a lot more now that needs to be inspected as a result of these installation certificates. That's a look at what potentially the NIC paperwork could look like. And like I said, it's across the board. It makes no difference the size of your installation. And to be honest, it's a pretty decent piece of kit. I like the old sheet, but I spent a lot of time understanding what needs to be done. And we spent a lot of time training people in how to be able to use it. But a lot of people used to put them together quite badly. But with this, it's, it's, I know it's quite patronising the how to, to teach how to suck eggs sort of thing. But you don't even have to put limbs and all the rest. It's straightforward ticks or NAs, you know what I mean? It's not cross. You can't put a cross on it. No, we haven't got protection in there. It's an initial verification. You're doing your pre-energisation checks, you're putting it into service and you're saying, whoopie do, I'm actually giving you a certificate this time to say it's good for use. We'll start putting crosses in. So you have got a ticket or you're not. And, you know, have you opened your eyes? Well, yes, I have. Ticket. It's that bleeding simple. I know it's a bit jokingly, but it's that simple to follow these particular steps that once you've gone <coughs> through it all, there really shouldn't be any stone left unturned. And it is pretty good. So I like it. Just put a bit more time on, but it's not have to be done for every distribution board, just the installation. It gives you a very, very detailed, very easy sort of list of things to look at. Condition reports. Now, what it was, was the only real change to condition reports was that, as previously, any um, inaccessible roof spaces or roof spaces were sort of kept outside the scope of condition reports. Again, back down to domestics, commercial, industrial, we go in plant rooms. You know what I mean? We go up on roofs, we do all that sort of thing, so it doesn't really sort of like count for that. But now an inspection should be made within an accessible roof space where electrical equipment is present. As Dave touched on before, the installations change on a daily basis in the UK. So now what we used to have, well, what we used to have was quite empty attic spaces in many respects. They were loop in, loop outs. There were no joint boxes in the attics or anything along the lines. Now we've got panels on the roofs. We've got inverters. We've got television amps. We've got fluorescent lighting. We've got sockets. We've got an £80,000 bathroom refurb that's just gone on somewhere. And it'd be damned if they're going to have any isolators for the shower or any other part of the equipment. So therefore we want it all up in the attic to which we've got a loft ladder to get up to if we need to later. So electrical equipment has inherently become situated or is, has become situated more and more with inside the attic spaces which it never used to where, where, where it never, never, never used to be so it's a case of if you know there's going to be electrical equipment in there get up there and have a look at it I mean, it makes it even worse now when you've got these sort of like uh, these green deal boys that are going out putting insulation inside your attics and they're just lobbing Insulation right across the cables that you've got inside your house. Some of the old houses are still wired in one mil. You throw 150 to 300 mil of rock wool over the top of that, you derate the rating of that cable. That's no longer fit for purpose to be able to provide power to the lights that you've got installed throughout, let alone the fire blankets for your down lights that you've got in there. So there's a lot more stuff that's going up inside attic spaces that we really need to be poking our heads across and having a look at. Outside, out of mind, doesn't really count. So they've asked us to deal with that. When we're talking about the other change, which was quite interesting to look at, was the fact that there are now different codings within inside the regs. We talked about, Dave mentioned about further investigation on your C1, C2, C3s. The column headed further investigation required, yes or no, has been deleted. However, it's still possible to state that further investigation is required in relation to an observation by means of an additional classification code, F1. Further investigation required which can now be placed in section K. The notes for the person producing this report has been revised with the regards to where the inspection has revealed an apparent deficiency that could only be fully identified due to the extent of limitation of the inspection. The note points out that if further investigation may reveal that the deficiency warrants the award of a classification C1 danger presence or C2, a further recommendation for investigation code F1 should be recorded with inside that particular scope. So rather than saying it's further investigation, yes or no, we're going to take that out. And if I see something there which is like maybe a recommended improvement, but it, I've got something niggling in my head here thinking that we really need to have a look at this. It needs to be investigated further because although it's just sort of like a recommended improvement, if we dig a little bit deeper, I think there's going to be an underlying problem here. 
which could turn out to open up a can of worms and really present a problem for the end user. So therefore, I'm then going to though looking at placing an F1 code in there and then reflecting that with inside the code that I've given to that particular item. Do you get my point? Because it's not enough to create a further investigation just because it'd be nice to know. Because we're not interested in things that are nice to know. We're interested in things that impair integrity and safety. So if by using this F1 code for something that would potentially be relatively innocuous in some respects, could turn out to be something pretty bloody bad, then that F1 coding and maybe a re-evaluation of your original code needs to be um, considered. And then that be placed on the section uh, dealing with observations and recommendations of inside a condition report. Okay. Little things to do with terminology instead of live and neutral. We've got live and live on minor work certificates for insulation resistance. There are little things. There are lots of little things in here, but we're not really going to cover the little things too much. So, Kashubi units. Second thing that the fire authority got involved with was the fact that there were five fires a week in domestic properties due to faulty connections on the heads of consumer units. As we touched on, or Dave touched on, where do we keep consumer units? Generally under the stairs. Next to uh, gas meters, we've got water mains, we've got a whole rake of stuff down there. So now what they're asking for is that, and when we looked at, you can see here it's a 200 number as well, UK specific only. The domestic, uh, within a domestic household premises, consumer units and similar switch gear assemblies shall comply with the relevant BSEN code and shall be constructed in a non-combustible or enclosed in a non-combustible enclosure. Beamer. Um, how much more paper have we got? Beamer have talked about, now when we had the draft publications it was talked about the fact that you could have this glow wire test, or not you could, but equipment that passed a glow wire test of 960 degrees C would be acceptable for this. The Beamer sort of like put clarifications on this in a technical bulletin that they released in October 2014 and sort of dismissed outright the, uh, the, the whole sort of draft publication statement relating to glow wire uh, equipment and state that at this present moment in time, metal will be considered to be the choice of material for these particular enclosures. And we talk about consumer units and similar enclosures because you could have RCD units, you could have all sorts of little units, switch units, so they need to be also of a non-combustible or not readily combustible material. So you go and buy one of these things and you put it under the stairs and you go and put a knockout in the top of it to get it to a nurse and you've just destroyed your fire rating. You had blanks, plastic blanks in the front of these consumer units which have destroyed the fire rating. So luckily they've got the racks into shape with this a bit because previously when we were talking um, in September at a technical talk that I watched from, uh, conducted by Darren Stanley for from Searchshaw NIC, at that point in time, they had no answer, not him, but industry had no answer for how you maintain the fire rating. And there was talk about some sort of expanding fire rated foam. Good God, can you imagine that in a domestic house? Now we're looking at cable glands to go in the top of it. We're looking at, I think Hager and whatnot have brought out consumer units with leads that pop down and they've got fire rated uh, metal sort of blanks that go in the front of the distribution boards and fire rated cable glands to go in the top to be able to maintain that fire rating. I still don't know why they don't just insist in putting smoke detectors, interlink smoke detectors underneath your, underneath your uh, distribution board. Because if that goes up, it's, it's going to contain it a bit, but you're asleep at night. So look at the house and hotter and hotter. So if you had a fire smoke detector underneath the stairs that goes off when you boil water, um, not really, but if you're making a piece of toast, it goes off for love and the money. This will then trigger and give you adequate time to be able to evacuate the house properly because before this fire there is smoke isn't there and it's going to trigger these things off because they are ultra sensitive so there is a lot that's being done at the moment with regards to these particular enclosures and the fire rating for them it's important to notice that it's been important to note that this doesn't come into effect until january next year we would say that this doesn't come into effect until january next year because Industry is looking at being able to address the issues of these particular um, enclosures and also when we're looking at metal enclosures, what about TT installations? So there's a lot of things that they're looking at in being able to address with this point, or maybe not even so much of a point, 
The cynics will probably say that it doesn't come until January next year because there's a raft of wholesalers around the country with warehouses full of plastic consumer units that they need to sell before we start bashing out these metal ones. Okay, I'd like to go for the first one and say it's because they're looking towards being able to create products which are going to be fit for purpose. EMC Directive. In the common real section, I'm going to skirt on this one a bit because it probably won't relate much to the people that are working inside here as much as it did when I was in Newcastle for some reason. But does anybody know about the EMC? Do we know what EMC is? Has anybody ever experienced electromagnetic incompatibility? Cool. So we just... No, just uh, the only time out there was, you know, welding plant. Yeah. Where you, you know, arc welding, which affected the internal... Yeah, it uh, does, it? Yeah. It puts it all off. Okay. Who have you used to have one of these things at home? What is it? Just, we're going to say no for there. Right, it, it's a poor man's internet. It's CB radios. I used to have one of these sat next to my bed with a car battery. And I remember watching, I'm not a United fan, right? I'm going to say that now. I know where I am. And I'm not saying it for effect, but I'm not, I'm not a United fan. Although, you know, I watched one of the greatest matches of football that night. And I watched them win the European Cup. And we had Sheringham and Solskjaer, I think, scored in two minutes. And they took the trophy. And I, like I said, I, I don't really follow football that much. But I want to sat by my bed and the battery on there and I picked it up, oh bloody hell, this is unbelievable, this, and I clicked it and then that happened to my TV. And I'm thinking, oh, okay. Okay, so anyway, so I thought, oh, never mind, don't worry about it. So I clicked it, are you watching this? And that happened to me on my dad's TV downstairs. Fucking shit's going on here. But then I remember some of my mates, they wanted to have a better range on these particular devices, so they put a booster on it, and then when they pressed it, that happened to the neighbours' TVs as well. And that's a prime example of electromagnetic incompatibility. They don't really like us using mobile phones and aeroplanes. Electromagnetic incompatibility. If you were lucky enough to have one of those cars in the 80s, uh, when you were driving past them big um, golf balls up towards Harrogate, the effects of the, uh, the, the radio waves from the early warning radar stations on Harrogate, it'd be like something <coughs> that would bleed in X-Files. Your, your car would lose power, the speedometers would drop down, your lights would blink on and off, you thought you were going to be abducted, and you'd be able to sell your story to the sun for a fortune. That's another example of electromagnetic incompatibility. They even realised that back in the day, that if you were clever enough, you could pull up to a forecourt, fill up with petrol, and because of the earlier um, electrical pumps that you used to have, um, because of electromagnetic incompatibility, you used to be able to fill your vehicle up for free. So then they started looking at, well, the IEC, at this point in time, and it wasn't because people were getting free petrol, by the way, but because of the equipment that's actually being placed in installations and how you can switch something on and it can have an adverse effect on something else, you can even play with your remote control car at home and it can probably buggy your TV up sometimes. That there are requirements in science now for designers to take electromagnetic incompatibility into account and to provide the relevant documentation when you're designing an installation to ensure that equipment that is being installed in that installation does not have an adverse effect on the normal operating conditions. Okay? A little bit more technical about the EMC, but we're not going to get onto that. But other areas of consideration, talking RCD protection. I'm kind of conscious at the time. Within RCD protections, in the um, second edition of the wiring regulations, there was a lot of requirements for RCDs to be placed on socket outlets. 13 amp socket outlets down here and also socket outlets providing equipment outdoors. You could remove RCDs if in some, under certain circumstances, if they were supervised by skilled and instructed individuals. Okay, that's no longer the case. We're not interested who looks after an, an installation anymore. So RCDs everywhere. Now, there are ways of being able to remove RCDs. At design stage, you can remove an RCD from an installation if you provide a documented risk assessment determining that the RCD protection is not necessary. You're looking at hospital installations, you're looking at areas where you can't really place RCDs on some equipment because it can have an adverse effect on life, if you will. There are installations where you may not want to put an RCD and put some other sort of effective earth monitoring on to be able to provide adequate protection, but you can't put an RCD on them sockets. So therefore, we need to be able to omit it, and that needs to be provided at that point of, uh, of, point of certification, a documented risk assessment. What form or format this documented risk assessment is to take, we do not know. Not yet. Questions to and from, okay? 
Other ways, specifically labelled and other suitably identified socket outlets provided for connection of particular equipment. So, in a nutshell, you walk into an office, there's loads of sockets everywhere. I can't put an RCD on this, it's going to trip out for fun. It's going to give me loads of nuisance tripping, what am I going to do? You'll come up with, we'll go and get them red sockets, right, that cost a few quid, and we'll go and get them with a special pins that you can't plug a hoover into. Right, it's great, how much is that going to cost me? Get away, no chance. What else have I got? I've got a b and I'll buy myself a Dynatape labeler, and I'll just print out for IT use only. Print it, and I'll go over to my socket, and I'll put my little sticker on, for IT use only. Go to my next one, IT use only, print it on. IT use only, print it on. Brilliant, so I don't need to put an RCD on that socket. Oh shit, I didn't see that. I still can't put an RCD on that circuit, but you're going to use that for your Uber when you come cleaning up later on. I'm sorry to say that you're a cleaner, he's going to come over and punch me, he's like, I've done 15 years at university, you cheeky sods. But, what do I do? So, I'll take that socket front off, and what I'll do is I'll place an RCD fronted socket on that particular socket outlet. So therefore, I'm still not having to protect the circuit, I'm still not going to cause nuisance tripping because of the electronic equipment on that, but I've identified the sockets which are going to be used by general people for general use for cleaners, and I've protected them sockets for general use. The rest of it, I've just label up for IT use only. And I've instructed everybody, you do not plug your bleeding mobile phone charges into them sockets. I'm sorry, honey, but it's for IT use only. Okay. Other than that, it's a documented risk assessment determining why it's not necessary and that is to be given at the time you have a installation certificate at initial verification after design submitted. But what format, what content, how it's going to look, not quite sure yet. Cables in walls, regardless of the user, RCDs everywhere. Cables installed to a depth of 50 mil required RCDs unless it was under skilled and instructed people. Yes, I have missed out the fact that there are cables out there you can use to be able to omit the need for RCDs. We're not going to cover that on here, you know, earth metallic screening, etc., because we're looking at mechanical damage here. But now, it's a case of if it's not being used, uh, or it's not being installed using that particular cable, then regardless where it used to be under skilled and instructed supervision, we want RCDs on it. Okay, so RCDs everywhere unless you use the, the correct cable. It used to be that you, know, you would come along and you would be supervising this installation. You knew the wiring zones. You knew, and you were the only person to be able to go over and put a picture on the walls. So you knew exactly that socket down here, coming up here, I'm not going to go and put it here. I'll put it over there. You've perceived risk. There's no problem whatsoever. You're skilled and instructed. Dealt with. Forget it. Not interested anymore. Theoretically speaking, you can probably fling a cable diagonally across the wall because it's going to be protected by an RCD. Wiring zones are still in effect. I wouldn't advise you to do that. It's not good practice. Okay, I'm going to say that just for the, the diagonal cable, just for effect at this particular point. But the point is that regardless of the depth, regardless of the supervision, it's RCDs every day of the week unless you've installed it in a manner which has adequate mechanical protection. Okay. So in essence, that is, and I know a little bit run over, um, that is in essence everything that you need to know with regards to the changes to the wiring regs. There is so much there we could go into, there is so much more that we could really get in depth with. There are things dealing with um, sort of exhibition stands, we've got people that work for conferencing companies that have now the competency definition removed from it and they have to be deemed to be electrically skilled. They're there laughing at us thinking they'll never be able to enforce it and they've always tried to bring in some sort of law but we've always had the electricity at work regs and the health and safety at work act in play. There are other areas we've inside there relating to low voltage lighting which for outside which have now been given its own special location. But there is so much more, but there's the bare crux of the changes to the wiring regs. It may seem like a minefield, but it's not that bad. And once we get into it and we have a look at it, from a design aspect from July, that will all come into play. From a testing aspect, yes, we have to look at it retrospectively to a point, 
but we've also got to work in a measured fashion, knowing full well that if you're good at your job, you're going to look at the other additions that these installations will have been constructed to and to see whether what you're actually assessing and commenting on affects integrity and safety. That's all we're interested in. It's integrity and safety, not what we can get out of you on remedials. Okay? Now, usually at this point, well, before we carry on, because I am conscious of the time for you, do we have any questions on the regs? Nope. Just I thought, you know, the, on the, uh, the voltage discrimination, uh, the 0.95. Yeah, yeah. Um, as you're saying, you know, the, the ZS table, you can actually, a manufacturer, let's pick a figure of one ohm, that, that's in the, uh, the guide, yes. uh, the regs that a manufacturer might actually give a higher one than that. <laughs> These are only generic values, and this, yeah. this, is this the thing? They're only generic values? Yeah, so, you know, the on-site guard usually takes the 80% the into consideration, yes. and then they, they give you a table. I mean, it's causing a confusion. Why don't you just say, where? It's so exactly the same thing. I thought, why have that 80%? Why don't you just give us one value and be done with it? Yeah. No idea. I say exactly the same thing. I just sat there and just thought, and then you're still asking us to put 80% on top. Well, yeah, across the board. I said, it can't be across the board because it's, it's, under, it's under design conditions. Because really, when we're looking at the on-site guides, I mean, that's only for installations up to 100 amps. So people say, but at the end of the day, design's design. It makes no difference. But when we're, when we're looking at it, that we're, on a design aspect, you would take... Um, you, would, you, would, you would design your, your, your particular cable run, you would say, right, using your scale reel, blah, 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 and I've got, say, 15 metre run here, basically, for this lighting circuit. I've got uh, a 2.5 live, uh, and I've got a 1.5 CPC. Then you would get your box, and at the back of here, you'll find there's a table giving you the, the resistivity of a length of meter, uh, meter length of copper. So you'll be able to, through calculation, work out what the R1, the R2 value will be of that length. Then from inquiry, um, based on what installation you've put together, you will then calculate your ZS, which is taken into consideration that seeming value. But because it's a calculation, it's a design stage, you will then apply Appendix 14 to that value. Now, get into the real world, and we're working in an installation that we've got MCBs, manufacturer's data, that says that this has been stress tested long times, uh, many, many times, and these are the values we've got for disconnection times. And we've gone and we've done a test, and that is our value under load conditions in a live installation, and it complies with both that particular book and also the manufacturer's recommendations. What point would the beta then apply an 80% on top of that? If you're, working in, if you're working out of hours, because you can't switch things off and you're doing live testing and stuff like that, out of hours under the correct conditions outlined with inside the electricity at work regulations, that is, um, it's not under load conditions, and therefore you would then, theoretically speaking, apply that 80% on top of your measured value because you're simulating what would happen under load conditions. So it's a case, again, being quite measured. Granted, why not just give us one value and be down with it? But I don't think really they can give us one value because you've got a design side of things, you've got an out of hours, non-load side of things, but you've also got load side of things, haven't you really? So it's, it would be nice just to have one. You could go to the nth degree and say, well, these three circuits are in hours, but this circuit's not being used, so we'll apply 100% values to them and 80% to that. That's, that's probably taking it to the nth degree, which you know, I'm not prepared to do, so you're going to make a decision one way or another. In hours, 100% values. Out of hours, put your 80% on top of it. And that way, you're, going to, you're always erring on the side of caution, remember, because you're not given a certificate. There's a lot of people that will say that, you know, we're certifying the installation safety. You're not. You're providing a report on integrity and safety. We'll go into, say, a shop for a national chain and we can't switch anything off and we're not talking, you know, there's nobody that's here today. And we'll go into a shop and we'll say, we, we can't do, you know, we can't do any dead testing because there's no distribution board schedules. It's a fully operational building. We can't risk switching even a 10 amp breaker off just in case it supplies a fire alarm and a burglar alarm. What do you do? Some people on many forums will say, I'm walking away from it because I can't do it. I would be, listen, you do that, you still deserve to be a tester because you're being asked to provide a report on the integrity and safety of an installation. So get in there, get into the nitty gritty of it, do the visuals like we were talking about before, cover the whole building, tell me what you think of my building 
And if you can't switch things off, what can you do? Well, you've got thermals you can supplement it with. You've also got the fact that we'll come in here and we'll go, right, we can't switch it off. I've got 20 lights, so I'm going to write down on my page two. So on my page two, so I've got all limbs all over me bleeding descriptions and stuff like that, apart from the cable sizes. But I'll go office and I'll go four times lights and I'll have six times sockets, right? But I know definitely it's going to be provided by that board over here. So I've got a long one to lead, so I'll give you an R2 value on these and I'll also give you a ZS. And I'll look at them ZSs and I'll think the readings that I've been given will trip any breaker out in that board. So I know at this point in time, you can operate safely in this environment. But I'm going to recommend that in your interest, you're going to want to shut this place down at your earliest possible convenience to be able to ascertain what breaker protects what particular circuit. So in an ideal condition with a lot of people, it's a case of you want to be able to have control of this, you want to have control of that, but you can't because it's not an ideal condition. So you've got to be able to go in there and be the best person you can and give the best and most informed decision as you put the most informed information that you could possibly give. Answer the question, yeah. Yeah, it does confuse, yeah. but it's there for a reason. It's, I don't think they really can get away with it because there's always going to be a need for something to be used in design stages and dead conditions in order to be able to simulate a live function environment. Otherwise, you could really reduce <coughs> them right down and then it would just be probably bleeding ridiculous, I would think. Any other, con any other questions? Nope. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming down.